Oh, Emma, yeah. Yeah, I, I thought, Jesus changed. I told Lisa, I said, I could almost see my bald spot. I was like, I'm going to move over. <laughs> I was like, I don't, I don't want to bring no man's me. I told Lisa to move the camera just to the left, like that far. And it was Good morning. Good to have everybody with us this morning. <clears throat> Smiling faces and happy hearts. And uh, no, if you, once you find a seat, you can't get another one. <laughs> I'm sorry, ma'am. Are you new here? <laughs> right. Uh, right. So good to have you with us this morning on this uh, sunny morning. Wasn't it beautiful out there? Did you all see the sunrise this morning? Oh, it's absolutely gorgeous, beautiful, and uh, uh, enough to make you want to get up early in the morning every morning just to see it. Amen. Uh, this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Sometimes it's a whole lot easier than others. Amen. And this would be one of those days, bright sunshine, a little warm out there, and uh, some wonderful news um, among many of the news that's out there I had a chance to talk with Bill uh, yesterday and uh, from the day that he could not even speak to me to be able to talk with him yesterday quite an improvement and I'll share some more about that in the service to follow but what an answer to prayer and a blessing there and uh, Anna is doing much better, uh, and that's an answer to prayer. And so, um, uh, just so many wonderful things happening. Uh, I don't know if you saw the uh, prayer uh, text, but Anne's eye, they saw just a small smidgen of improvement. Yes. And so, uh, they, the latest therapy was taking some of the plasma from her own blood and using that as the eye drop. Uh, to affect that scratch in her eye that's prohibiting her from being able to see. And uh, said, not huge, but any progress mm -hmm. towards the goal is positive. Amen. Mm -hmm. So praise the Lord for that. A lot of good things happening. And uh, uh, I just shared with me, yeah, I'm always the last one to find out about anything, but uh, for the kids' camp, I think it's uh, $1,600 that has come in. 
uh, as a special donation to offset the cost of camp. What a blessing that is. Mm -hmm. uh, so, a lot of positive, and we thank the Lord for that. Uh, we've been uh, studying for some time on uh, uh, principles of Bible study, and uh, we are going to continue today. Uh, we've gone through the ethnic principle, the context principle, the applicational principle, the typical principle, the discrimination principle, and we have found ourselves now uh, just at the, the beginning of the numerical principle, and so we'll, we'll get into that. We start, started last week, and uh, I tempted you uh, and teased you so long, and I'm going to do it a little more today because it was so much fun last week. Um, but if you're joining us online, we're so thankful to have you today and uh, wish that you were able to be here with us. I know that there are several that join us that would like to be here, and um, but glad that God's provided the opportunity for us to be able to meet with you online, and uh, I hope that you can follow along today. You're probably sitting there with your cup of coffee and still in your PJs. And uh, we're not the least bit jealous at all here. But, um, and then for others, I know uh, Rob's wife's not in the best right now. She's still struggling with uh, her issues. And so others will be uh, watching um, maybe not as comfortable as I just described. So, um, we were talking about the numerical principle last week. We got started in it. And, a lot of the things that we said last week and some of the things that we're going to say today are really a review of some of the things that we've already discussed, but it's good to have a review so that we can make sure that we are um, thinking correctly, and so we're going to do that here in just a minute. Uh, but we, we got started with that. Um, the pattern is, I just want to kind of give a an overview of the numbers, and then we're going to come back and do a deeper dive, if you would, into the numbers. But I, I want you to just get an idea of, of the numerics and how they work, and um, and we'll go from there. But let's start first with a word of prayer. Does anybody know this lady here? I mean, it's, it's been a year since she's been here. You, you may want to give her a visitor's card. We can do that. So. <laughs> That's good to have my mom back with us today. And... Uh, I found her hitchhiking on 29. I picked her up. I felt sorry for her. And then I realized it was my mom and I should have let her walk. You know, so <laughs> let's start with, with a word of prayer. <laughs> Father, thank you so much for your goodness to us today. Uh, your mercies are fresh and new every morning. Uh, thank you, Lord, for your abundant grace and long suffering, your presence in time of trouble. Thank you, Lord, for. Um, giving us the opportunity to meet here today in this hallowed place and at this hallowed time. Father, I pray that you bless this book and our study of it. In Jesus' name, amen. So, in the introduction of Numbers, uh, we discussed um, several, I would call foundational principles. Uh, one was just the importance of Numbers. Uh, numbers play an important part um, and um, there's a there is a dynamic spiritual blessing that we receive um, when we look at the Bible in any way, and numbers is no exception. Um, we considered Hebrews chapter four verse twelve: the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit you know, the thoughts. And the intents of the heart, the bone, the marrow, I mean, it's, it's a, it knows us very well. And so we talked about the importance of numbers as if, <clears throat> if the Word of God can separate, parse, if you would, the intents of the heart, the bone, the marrow, if it can do that, then the Word of God has a lot of power. And we also learned that Jesus said, not one jot or tittle, <clears throat> will pass away till all these things be fulfilled. So, and we learn that the jot and tittles are the little marks on the Hebrew letters that have meaning, but they're just real little tiny specks almost. They look almost like ink blots, you know, like the P 
pen drops some ink somewhere. But if they are important, then even the numbers in the Bible are important. We talked about the danger last week of whenever there's an importance to God with His Word, the enemy is always on the attack to take the very things that God's given to us and pervert it. I think of music. I love music. I love the sound of harmony. Uh, I love the beautiful blend of voices. And yet the devil has stuck his foot into there and he's perverted the very things that God created. And so it, it is true as well when we look at the principle of numerics in the Bible, uh, we shouldn't be surprised that the devil is involved in that too, in perverting it. He's always wanting us to doubt uh, his word and, and uh, uh, so he does it through uh, the occult who uses numerics, astrology, all that kind of stuff. But he also uses it through people that get a little imbalanced. And it's important as a Christian that we're balanced. Um, when I was growing up, they used to say uh, about the preacher, he's on his hobby horse again. That meant he was not balanced. He was on something that was real important to him, and he just couldn't get anywhere in the Bible without finding that hobby horse and jumping on that horse and riding it for a while. And that, that is wrong. Uh, we should be balanced. It shouldn't just be, you know, that we have one thing in our crawl, so to speak. So we talked about the danger of being so focused on the numbers that you forget all the other principles. And we talked about the importance of a building is fitly joined together. There's many parts, but they all fitly join together. And the purpose of that is for strength and for stability. And so as we look at our, our principles of Bible study, there are several principles. Don't ever want to just get one of them and get locked into the one and forget all the others. Then we talked about biblical numbers are inspired. And uh, <clears throat> now I understand that the verses and the chapter headings of the Bible were added uh, to help us locate it. It's kind of like if you said we live in Sydney, that would be a pretty big dig to try to find you. But if you say, I live in Sydney and I live on Main Street, that helps it a little bit, unless Main Street's 45 miles long. So then we say, I live in Sydney on Main Street at 3252. And that helps people find us. And so that's what they did with the Bible, to make it easier to find specific verses uh, or passages in the Bible. They added chapters and they added verse numbers. Now, I am of the opinion personally that inspiration and preservation are two different things. Inspiration is God breathed into man his words. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. And so I believe that the instrument that God used was his spirit and the human instrument he used were the people that penned the words, but they uh, allowed, God allowed their Personalities come through their writing, but the words are specifically what God wanted. Preservation is a different thing than inspiration, in my opinion. Preservation is the promise that God made in Psalms 12, 6, and 7. The words of the Lord are pure words. The silver tried in a furnace of earth purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them forever. And the preservation allows for you to go from one language to another language, and get the pure word of God, even though the languages are different. And so preservation is God acting with his inspiration to make sure that we have a completed canon of scripture, divinely inspired and divinely preserved by God. I personally believe that God did that through the authorized version of the Bible. Not everybody agrees with me, and it's not a point of contention with me, but I believe that there's enough evidence to, to see that overwhelmingly. And so when we talk about biblical numbers are inspired, I'm not necessarily saying that the chapter heads and the verse numbers are inspired of God. I would say they're preserved. Okay, But within the text of the Bible, the numbers that show up are inspired. Like, if there's numbers in the Bible, those numbers are inspired. They're the inspired Word of God. To show that God preserved His Word, as well as inspired His Word, 
when we look at the inspired numbers in the Bible, and then we look at the verses, numbers, and we look at the chapter headings, we find God preserved the same thing. And I'll show you some of that a little later on. Is that even in his preservation, he kept the inspired concept of those numbers. For instance, 3 is about the Trinity, and we find it even in the verse numbers and the chapter headings, consistent, and many of the other numbers as well. So even though we talk about biblical numbers are inspired, I like to make a distinction between inspiration and preservation. <clears throat> Preserve God's word is God's purpose to preserve his word to us and give it to us. Inspiration is something that happened one time when God inspired people, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And so, but biblical numbers are inspired, meaning that we didn't just make it up. And we looked at that last week in Revelation 13, verse 18. Here is wisdom. <clears throat> Let him that hath understanding count the what? The number of the beast, for his number is... It is the number of a man, and his number is 600, three score, score is 20, right? So three score is 60. His number is 600, three score and six, or 666. <clears throat> so the, the actual numbers in the Bible are inspired, and this would be an example of that. Now, as I mentioned about the chapter headings and the verse numbers, uh, we find this truth in Revelation 13 and verse number 18. And if we divide 18 by 3, what do you come up with? 666. Six, six. So that's what I was meaning. There's, there's this, the preservation of God brings this to our thought. Now, in this passage, Revelation 13, 18, let him have, that hath understanding count the number of the beast. We know this beast is the Antichrist. Alright? And he is the opposite of Christ. He's the Antichrist. And when we think about how blessed we are in Christ, we would think how cursed we are in Satan or the Antichrist. And so, uh, there is this thing that originated in the Bible and then has been brought into our society that if you have a room or a, a large building and it has 26 floors, <coughs> bless you, what floor is missing? 13. 13. Because 13 is considered the unlucky or bad evil number. And so here in Revelation 13 and verse 18, and that's where I say there is this overwhelming evidence that God superintended the preservation of his word consistently with his superintending of the inspiration of his word. All right, so we talked about that last week, and then we talked about interpreting biblical numbers. And I... I, uh, I don't want to go through uh, everything all over again, but I think it's important for us to get a basis, if you can. Um, so, a proper understanding of numbers is possible through application of biblical principles. So, the first principle that we uh, need to consider when we look at numbers is the principle of uh, interpretation. That is, discernment and interpretation should be done spiritually. Now, although I didn't put that as one of the principles of Bible study when we began our study, I prefaced the principles of Bible study with this. In order to study the Bible, what's the first thing you have to know? You have to know the author, right? So you have to know Christ as your personal Savior. You can't ever find out God's Word if you don't know the author of the Bible. Remember what Paul wrote about there in 1 Corinthians? He said uh, that the things of God are spiritually discerned. I mean, you have to, you can't understand the things of God unless you know the author himself. And so one of the things that's important is to have spiritual discernment 
so that we can understand God's word. Um, and uh, that was 1 Corinthians 2.14, the natural man, the unsaved man, uh, receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, their foolishness to him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. They, they can only be understood if you know the author. All right. Number two, the Bible should be taken literally, except for when symbolism is obvious. I'm, I'm going to give you some examples of that. And this is really a, a huge thing. <clears throat> we haven't studied this principle yet, but one of the principles we're going to study is about the literal interpretation of the Bible. So if we look at the Bible and we say it's just a collection of stories that we're supposed to be inspired by, that's different than taking a literal approach. A literal approach means God spoke to me and his words are important to me. Not the concepts, not the principles, but his words. A literal. So God's word means that it should be taken literally. Um, what do I mean by that? Well, Pharaoh's army did drown in the Red Sea. That's literal, okay? Jonah was swallowed by a great fish. That's literal. We take that. Jesus was raised from the dead. That's literal. When we look at the Bible, when it says something to us, we take it literally. Only where obvious symbolism is used do we take the Word of God symbolically. For instance, look at John chapter number 10 with me. John chapter 10. John chapter 10. This is Jesus speaking. And look at verse number 11. John chapter 10, verse number 11. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. I'm the good shepherd. Now, there's no indication historically that Jesus ever cared for literal sheep out in the countryside. In fact, everything about him historically says he didn't, okay? Uh, now, the New Age people, they like to capitalize on the age of 12 to 33, the lost years of Jesus. And that's when they would say he was a nomad and <clears throat> he went to the Eastern people to glean all the wisdom that he came back and But we, uh, you know, that along with uh, Looney Tunes, we pass that off to the side, okay? It's uh, fun to entertain ourselves with that. But there's no historical evidence at all that Jesus literally kept sheep. And so here's an example of this obvious symbolism that he's using here. And uh, it says not only did is he the good shepherd, but it says the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. And it says Jesus didn't die for sheep. He died for who? Us. And what are we likened to symbolically in the Bible? Sheep. So, so, again, if the Bible can be taken literally, we always take it literally, only when it is obvious that it's symbolic. Now, Brenda has said a couple times that I do resemble an animal, but it wasn't sheep, okay? So, <laughs> occasionally, she has said that I have some characteristics. <laughs> okay, but it, it's not sheep. So when the Bible comes out and, he, and it specifically addresses literal, we take it as we can literal. Thirdly, the Bible must be interpreted within its proper context. And that's one of the principles that we have uh, covered, the, uh, the uh, principle of context. And that is, specifically, you can't build a doctrine on one isolated scripture. Now, we're not going to retrace this, because I think we've already talked about this before. But if you go through and you pick out all the different denominations and the variations of those denominations today, if there's one thing that characterizes all of them, including Baptists, is that they begin their, their belief system on one verse that has nothing to do with the other verses that are around them. And so we have to beware that we always take context. All right? And that's such an important thing. So we want to make sure that we 
consider the context. You must consider all that the Word of God has to say on a subject. Uh, we consider similar passages. We consider similar words. The number <clears throat> to learn all these things that we can gather so that we can ascertain <clears throat> what a certain subject is about. And so we do all that. That's the context. We look at all of it. And the reason is, is because if you look at the context, <clears throat> what does the context eventually bear out? The interpretation of the passage. It'll give it to us. I'll give you an example. Turn to Mark chapter 4 with me. Mark chapter 4. <clears throat> Again, this is Jesus speaking. Mark chapter 4. And look at verse number 3. And this is a parable of uh, Jesus, Mark chapter 4, <clears throat> and it's found in the other Gospels. We just are looking at Mark chapter 4. Look at verse 3. Hearken, behold, there went out a sower to sow. Now, we're familiar with this parable, right? And it says he sowed the seed, and the sowed seed fell on different types of soil. Okay? Now, we read this all the way down through verse 9, and then what did he say in verse 9? He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. So the disciples got him a little later on, verse number 10, when he was alone, they that were about him with the twelve asked him the parable. They wanted to know what's that mean. Look at verse number 11. He said unto them, Unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables. He said, I spoke in a story form because the only way you can understand a story form is if you're spiritually dis have discernment. And so then he says, that seeing you may see and that not and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest at any time they should be converted and their sins should be forgiven them. And he said unto them, Know ye not this parable? You don't understand this? All right, verse 14. I'm going to tell you what it is. The sower soweth the word. And these are they by the wayside, where the word is sown. But they, when they heard, Satan cometh immediately and take away the word that was sown in their hearts. And these are likewise, which are sown on stony ground, who, when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness, and have no root in themselves, and so endure for a, sh a, a time. Afterward, when affliction or persecution arrive for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word. So you see, he's giving the interpretation of the parable he just gave. And that's the reason the context is always important. Now, sometimes it's really obvious, like this. Sometimes it's not as obvious, but it's always in the context, and that's the reason that it's important. Number four, the Bible is interpreted according to precedent. All right? That's letting me know that I'm supposed to stop. But I'm not going to pay any attention to it. Uh, <clears throat> uh, precedent, okay. <laughs> um, the Bible is interpreted according to precedents. Precedents, previous biblical explanations or uses of a number, help to determine the meaning. So we say, well, how was this word used before? In what context was it used? So we walk back into a scripture, and we examine it, and we go, oh my goodness, look at that. Or the numbers, again, and we look at that. Uh, I've spoken a lot about this. Would you use this as an example of the numbers? How many times did Peter deny the Lord? Three. Three times. And then remember how we've talked about when Peter was up on the top of uh, the roof and the sheet came down from heaven? How many times? Three. Three. And how many people were at the front door? Three. And when Jesus rose from the dead and he spoke to Peter privately, how many times did he ask him if he loved him? So you see, the precedent is so important to pick up the precedent because it tells us a lot about uh, what we're looking at. So precedent is a very important thing in the Bible, how the number is used or explained elsewhere in Scripture. Now, <clears throat> as with biblical prophecy, also with numbers and words, there are often multiple interpretations. I mean, it just doesn't stick with just one thing. There are threads, if you would. And they connect them. And so, again, the context would tell you which one of the threads is being spoken of. 
In biblical prophecy, there is often an immediate fulfillment, and then there is also a future fulfillment that's spoken of in the Bible. And so, as you think of this, <clears throat> precedent is important. Because we look at the precedent, we try to figure it out by the best that we can by just examining scriptures. For instance, <clears throat> we've talked about this. In Acts chapter 2, when the Spirit of God came upon the disciples, and they began to speak in the foreign languages of those who had been dispersed, the Jews who had been cast into other lands, came back for the fellowship and the celebration of Passover, and were in Jerusalem, and the disciples who had never been out of Jerusalem started speaking in the native tongue of those people who had come from all these different lands. And remember, it lists the whole number of all the different places they came from. They, the scoffers around, they wanted to try to give explanation of that. And so they mocked the disciples and they said they're drunk with wine. All right? And they were speaking about being drunk with wine in the first part of the day. And Peter's response was what? That they're not drunk, but this is that which is spoken of by the prophet. Do you remember the prophet? Joel. And he walks back to Joel chapter 2 and he starts saying all these things that Joel said. Well, as we look at Joel chapter 2, and the context of what Peter was quoting, it says, in the great and dreadful day of the Lord, which is the second coming. So Peter said that what was happening on the day of Pentecost was also what was going to happen just before Jesus came back. And so it had a current and it had a future prophetic significance. Now we know why Peter spoke that, and that was because if they had received Jesus, it would have been the great and dreadful day of the Lord, but they rejected him. So all prophecy and numbers and words can have multiple threads or understandings throughout the Bible. And that's important. Precedent is important along with the context in which it is given. All right. And now, drum beat. Okay. <laughs> Understanding biblical numbers. That's the only reason you came to the class, right? I'm babbling about everything else. You just want to know about the numbers. Okay. In addition to applying the basic rules of interpretation like we've just spent some time doing, numbers must be studied in relationship to biblical languages. Now, this is something that not many people look at. Uh, I read about it and I get a little kind of a, oh, that's an interesting. Um, but a long time ago, um, I kind of made a commitment to English. <laughs> and uh, I, ever since I've made a commitment to English, um, everybody wants me to study Greek and Hebrew, <laughs> you know. Uh, and I'm, I'm still struggling with English. I certainly don't want to take on two others. So I'm just going to throw this out, but I wouldn't ever encourage anybody to spend a lot of time doing this because all of a sudden the devil will use that to say can't really understand what God wants you to understand by just the old English Bible you got to go back to the Hebrew and the Greek and all this kind of stuff but it is still interesting all right um, I don't know if you knew this but there are no numbers in the Hebrew and Greek alphabets no numbers so the Old Testament although this is a general statement written in Hebrew and the New Testament's written in Greek, and that's the general statements. The Hebrews, Greeks, and other ancient cultures use letters for numbers instead of numbers for numbers. Do you all know about Roman numerals? Okay, so, so you get the idea. And so uh, each letter in the Hebrew and Greek language, along with other cultures, had a numerical significance. So... When a word was written, it also had a numerical value or meaning to it. Let me give you an example. Um, well, let me first use English, because this is an easy, easy one, okay? Now, if I write the word alive, right, or I write the number one, 
Do you see the significance of the two? Is if, if the context bears whether it's a number one or if it's L. Now I put a little, let's just make it alive this way. <coughs> All right, and one. Does that make it a little easier for you? I had to put a little tick mark on there because I made a tick mark on that one. You guys wouldn't know what the tick mark was. That's a jot and a tittle. Don't you know that? Okay. So, so we, we could say that it was 10 cents or we could say it was alive. That, that, that line can mean both depending upon the context. Or uh, let me do this. And here we have it again. So in the English language, we know if that's a zero or if it's an O based upon the context. But in the English language, we've also become accustomed to the fact that some of our letters also have numeric value to them because the context bears it out. I just wanted you to see that so that you'd understand. So, um, I'm pausing because I just spoke about a half a page of notes. That's way too fast. I don't want to go back, okay? <laughs> okay. Uh, that's, ha that's what happens. You walk me away from the podium where my notes are, you know, I just go crazy. Um, so, I want you to remember. This example right here, because I'm going to show you how important that is in a little bit, all right? But just keep that in the back of your mind. So the context is what bears out what it is. The same is true with the Hebrew and the Greek. The authors knew these differences when they were writing numbers and letters. Each of the Hebrew and Greek letters has a number assigned to it. For example, um, consider the word Jesus. All right, the word Jesus. <clears throat> In Greek, the word Jesus is written like this. All right, can you all see that as my, okay, right and low. All right, <clears throat> and so the numerical values is L equals 10. E equals 8. S equals 200. O equals 70. U equals 400. If you add those all up, you come with 888. Eight, eight. Now, it's a very interesting thing. We're not going to go much deeper than that. But I just want you to see that beyond what's the obvious to us, which is what we're in this class going to look at, the more obvious, that numbers are much deeper than what we think. And why would we think this strange? Why would we think that numbers in the Bible being so specific are strange when we think about the God who created them? I've been working outside uh, watching Brenda put up uh, trusses and uh, <laughs> and uh, a little more to the left, a little more right, uh, you know. And uh, already, I've seen three stages of insects hatch out. Three different ones. They've all bit me. Uh, <laughs> and and so, you know, but they're, they're like swarms. And I think, you know, they're, they're flying along and they just bump into stuff. Because they, they, they have no direction or anything like that. God has a purpose for them. And they might be a pest to us, 
But when you start looking at someone who has studied that insect, you realize the designer that designed that insect? I mean, absolutely. How many of you ever Sunday, Saturday morning listened to Ranger Bob? Oh, you don't? Oh, okay. Okay, I'll, I'll go on. Uh, well, anyway, uh, <laughs> on the Christian radio stations, they have these guys that act like an insect. And they give all the particulars about God's designing of them to meet what they're supposed to do and be in the cycle of life. And it is just amazing. Titus eats that, uh, not literally. But I mean, he, he loves that. Just listening to these, and they call him Uncle Bob, and the, the insect. And uh, so it's, it's fascinating. And you can get it on almost any radio station, Christian radio station, uh, still. The fascinating facts about the design of God's creation. And when you think about the design and the particular um, specifics of that, would it be any wonder that there is numerics within God's creation and his word and how important that it is? Okay? Now, the application of spiritual truths. The primary purpose of scripture is to communicate spiritual truth. It's not to fascinate us with numbers. Are you with me? <laughs> I'm trying to make you balanced here. It's not to get us fascinated with numbers. It's to communicate spiritual truths and to do it in a way that we can understand and apply these biblical principles in our life. Thus, translating words into numbers and analyzing the significance of these numbers is meaningless if you don't gain spiritual insight that can affect your life. And you remember me telling you about a gentleman that thought he was King James, and, and he had no practical... The numbers were fascinating, but it, it didn't communicate any truth. It was just fascinating. And the devil would love for us to be fascinated and not change our lives. But God's word is to communicate truth so that that truth can change our lives. So the understanding the meaning of a number enables us to comprehend its prophetic significance so that you can prepare yourself accordingly. And the meaning of numbers can also encourage you, bless you, warn you. I mean, it's amazing what the numbers in the Bible can. So the spiritual significance of biblical numbers is apparent from the beginning of time. So let's go back to see where it all started. I kind of teased you last year or last week with this. Seems like last year, I'm sure. Uh, Colossians <laughs> chapter 1. Colossians <laughs> chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. I just want to start with, who is it that put these numbers together? Colossians chapter 1. Look at verse number 16. Who put all these numbers together anyway? Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. So in the context, when we read something and we don't understand, we always look before, right? So it says in verse 16, for by him, who's the him? How do we find that out? Well, we go back scriptures until we look at verse 13, who delivered us from the power of darkness that translated us into the kingdom of his dear son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every, of every creature, for by him, see the context, how that works, that's so important, for by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions, principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. So if you want to know the author or the origination of numbers, it is the Lord. All things, including numbers, as a way to represent quantities and things that God created uh, were created by Him. All right, so in the beginning, God measured, God weighed, God balanced His creation. Look at Isaiah chapter 40 with me. Isaiah chapter 40. Excuse me. 
try, just trying to keep you balanced. Don't, don't go off on numbers. It's so easy. People do it all the time. I know how many pastors have said, you know, I, had, I counseled someone the other day and I think they're in, uh, I think they're possessed. And so I went out and bought four books. And a year later, the pastor is not in the ministry. Got to be real careful that you keep balanced. Because there's certain things that are so fascinating that they'll draw you away. So balance is important. So look at Isaiah chapter 40 and look at verse 12. Who hath measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and meted out heaven with a span? That's like a ruler, okay? And comprehended the dust, the dust, (laughs) think of that, of the earth in a measure and weighed the mountains in a scale, in scales, and the hills in a balance. So just so you understand that this is not about John Young or about some other ridiculous person that's hung up on numbers. This is about, this is who God is. And we often miss this obvious that as it's brought out to our attention, we think, oh yeah, so numeric significance in Scripture is not a surprise when we consider the author of the Bible designed our universe. He measured the waters, determined the heavenly spans, capable of counting the grains of sand on the seashore and the hairs on our head, which every morning after I wash, I do this fluff thing, you know, to get it dried out. And I look it down there and I think, my goodness, we must have a dog in this house. I mean, it's like, you think, how can you still have hair on your head if you do that and you get that much all over the sink, amen? So he remembers the numbers of hair on our head. The natural order of our world is precise, so it is not surprising to learn that every word and number used by God is also meaningful. The first use of numbers in the Bible appear in the creation account. I mentioned this last week, zero. Zero is the first value presented. Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. And look at this. Genesis chapter 1 and verse number 2. And the earth was without form, and what's the next word? Void. Okay. According to a Scientific American article written in 2009 entitled The Origin of Zero, the number zero did not begin to take shape until the 5th century A.D. in India. The English word we use to represent it did not come into existence until about 1595 to somewhere around 1605 A.D. In order, in, in fact, it took human societies quite a while to wrap their minds around using zero as a value as it represented something that was contrary to their daily lives. In fact, the idea of a number, zero, that represented nothing was counterintuitive and controversial, raising philosophical as well as mathematical questions. Er, er, uh, Europe's first mathematics after all, was concerned mainly with counting and measuring solid items or objects, and you can't count nothing. That was their reasoning. Although the word word zero, that represents the number zero, the word and the number, is absent from the authorized version, the conceptual meaning behind it is found all through the Bible. All right? And um, I'm going to give you some examples. The synonyms of the word zero are none. That's used 358 times. None. Or nothing. It's used 225 times. Or empty. Used 38 times. Or not. It's an old English word. Not. 36 times. Or void, as in Genesis 1-2, 24 times. And the list goes on, but I just thought I'd give you the big ones. All right. Isaiah 55 is a wonderful example of this. Look at Isaiah 55. And verse number 11.
Isaiah 55 and verse number 11. You agree to today, Rob? Yes. Okay. Isaiah 55, verse 11. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me what? Void. Void. All right. But it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I send it. So his word is not going to return zero. All right. It's not going to return void or empty. And this is important. So the first number that we see in Scripture, Genesis 1-2, and the earth was out form and void uh, is an important number in the Bible. And though we see it by itself, as I just illustrated here in Isaiah, and we see it all through the Bible as by itself, when we use it, we almost always connect it with a, another number, don't we? Okay, so we say... It's 10 cents, or it's 5 cents, or it's 1,000 dollars. OK, so we, we connect zeros to it. And it's interesting, so it does in the Bible. You know why this is so fascinating to me is because of the absence of zero for so long in our culture. Have you ever thought about this? How far advanced um, we'd be in water if they'd have read the Bible instead of mythology? You know, in Christopher Columbus's days, they were afraid they were going to sail off the what? The edge of the earth. And yet Job is clear that the, that the earth is a sphere. It's a circle. If they just... And for years they thought that the sun was a light and the moon was a light. And yet Job specifically says that the moon reflects the sun. All these things that if we just believe the Bible, we come up with a lot sooner than we finally figured it out. But no one wants to take God at His word. We want to find this out ourselves and say, <laughs> I did it my way. But the same is true with numbers. We think of for you know, to the English, it wasn't until the 1600s that zero played a part in our culture because we just didn't think it was a number. And yet in the Bible, it comes up. And it can, comes up in connection by itself, but also in connection with other numbers, in conjunction with it. Okay, so let's go to Genesis, and we're going to stop right after this. Genesis chapter 1. Excuse me, I said Genesis. Um, yeah, Genesis. What did I say? So verse 5 tells us the first day, right? That's one. First day, right? And what was created the first day? The sun and the moon. Light and light. Light. Okay. And I told you to remember this. Did you remember it? What was created on the first day? Light. L. L-I-G-H-T. <laughs> and just, it's interesting how God just put these things together. Yeah. We, we look at it and it takes us a while to even comprehend it. But I mean, how inexhaustible are his riches and his ways past finding out. So, on the first day, he created L, light. And that is so significant because when we come to John chapter 1, in the first five verses, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. Without Him is not anything made that was made. In Him was life, L, and the life was the light, L, of men. And the light, L, shineth in darkness, and the darkness, darkness comprehended it not. So it's all through Scripture. Thus, the number one represents the unity of oneness. The unity of oneness and the truth that our Lord, our God, is one Lord, one God. Now, 
I want you to see how, and we'll stop with this, Isaiah, just two scriptures. Isaiah, what did I say? I was going to stop with Genesis, didn't I? All right, Isaiah, we will stop with this one. It's a paragraph mark on my notes. I have to stop. Uh, Isaiah 44, and look at verse 6. I want you to see how 1 and 0 are connected together in scriptures. You, you, you know, generally, we wouldn't even notice this. Isaiah chapter 44, look at verse 6. Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and His Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the what? And the last. Beside me there is what? Zero. You see that? There's no. There's zero gods. I am the first. And then you see the one and the two. Look at, in case you think I just made that up, look at chapter 45 and verse 22. Chapter 45. And look at verse 22. Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is what? None else. None else. Zero. So they, 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 the ones and the zero come together in the Bible. Well, not just the ones and the zero, but zero with other numbers. There's a combination of those that happen. So zero is, in the scriptures, uh, has a lot of different significance, but zero in the uh, Bible um, is this concept of the absence of anything but God. And one is the unity of oneness. God is one God. And this was on the first day when he created life out of void, out of nothing. And that light is the life of everyone. All right. So next week, Lord willing, I put a tick mark on my notes. Say, what does that mean? Not a thing. Uh, but we'll start, <laughs> we'll start with uh, day two. All right. All righty. But thanks for your attention this morning. All those things leading up to this are what's important. And honestly, I have, uh, through my years, found a lot of people that have gone off the deep end on numbers. I've said, found a lot of people that go off the deep end on prophecy. Because they, they get imbalanced. And uh, we're to be balanced people. Okay, Father, thank you so much for our time today. In your word, the truth of it. Help us, Lord, as we take it in. Uh, that, Lord, it would encourage us to live for you in a way that we have not before. And, Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be here. Such wonderful things to be able to thank you for. And we will do our best to try to give praise to you in the morning service. Thanks for those that join us online, for those that are here, and for the blessings that these bring to us. Bless your word and your people. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless. Have a great day. See you in about 15 minutes.